Hi, welcome everyone. Um, I'm very glad that you've all made this time to be here today um, and I'm very excited to be giving you a little workshop today on uh, strategic communication towards consumers and then in particular um, how we can actually influence consumer behaviour, for example, in order to influence people to uh, buy your new veggie products. And I'm also very excited to be a member of the jury and see what you all come up with. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what today uh, is going to be about. So we're going to be looking at um, how you can influence consumer behaviour. We're going to be looking at who is the consumer, how can you find out who the consumer is, and then also how can you actually build a campaign um, that influences their consumption choices. Um, so let's maybe first introduce myself um, so you actually know who's sitting in front of you. Um, so my name is Hannah, I am a second year master's student in environmental sciences here at Wageningen University and I am um, I'm also doing the uh, policy and economics thesis track, um, so I'm specialised in that and I've also got a bachelor's in communication science, so I do have a little bit of a background in uh, marketing and consumer uh, communication, so that's quite helpful and um, today we're going to be looking at a few of those theories that I've learned throughout those years uh, about um, consumer behaviour and how to, uh, you know, apply that in a campaign um, and hopefully you will learn something new. So if you could go to the next slide, Mia. Yeah, that's perfect, thank you. So um, yeah, today we're going to be talking about strategic communication, but there's actually loads of forms of communication. So for example, you've got interpersonal communication, um, which is basically a very fancy way of just saying, um, person A communicates with person B. Um, you've also, in addition, got mass communication, which is more about a, um, for example, that's happening with like television or radio, where one person is broadcasting a message to a very large audience um, and um, not necessarily expecting feedback. So that would be considered mass communication. But today we're going to be talking about strategic communication, which as you can also see from the slide, is communication in professional contexts aiming to reach certain goals and those goals for example can be to get someone to uh, in the end be convinced of and buy your veggie burger. So yes the classic model of a communication um, if you could go to the next slide Mia yeah that's great so um, I know you're also in high school but if any of you are perhaps considering and um, seeing anything marketing or communication related, then you are going to be getting uh, to know this model a lot more. Um, it is the sort of classic model. It was um, developed by uh, two scholars called Shannon and Weaver a long, long time ago, and it has been adapted and improved ever since. But the basics is still the same, um, which would be that, that, for example, in this setting here, um, I am currently the sender and I'm sending a message which is this workshop and I'm doing that through medium and the medium here is my voice but also um, uh, this zoom call and then you guys at the moment are the receivers of that message but of course you're interpreting the message entirely from your own experience or whether you maybe already know something about communication sciences so that matters for the way that you receive the message and then um, perhaps there could be a case of feedback where for example you have a question or um, you uh, just want to discuss something at the end so this is sort of like the classic model of communication and if we could go to the next slide I've brought this little slide with me because it has a picture on it that I think really tells us something about how communication is not always so straightforward. In fact, there's quite a lot of cases of miscommunication. So I think the central question with this picture is, who's right? And the thing is that actually both the man on the left and the right, they're both correct, but from their own point of view. And that's kind of what communication uh, sciences also is about. It's about the fact that people actually um, have their own sort of way of thinking about things and therefore um, are often 
thinking and interpreting new information from um, what they already know, essentially. Um, and that actually also has a uh, implication for how you design your campaign, because that m means that the way that others interpret the information that you send through your campaign is actually the most important thing. So it's not actually about how you intend your message to come across in, for example, a commercial. It's about how the receiver interprets it and whether the receiver likes your message. So you should kind of think about who's your audience and how will they receive my message and um, is that the way that I intend it to. So if we could go to the next slide. So what exactly is that target audience that we're talking about? Well, um, that kind of depends, of course, on what you're trying to communicate with your campaign. So, for example, with your veggie burger, it may be people that are vegetarians already, or it may be people that are very curious to vegetarianism, but are still eating meat. Whatever sort of audience you uh, choose and target your campaign towards, it's important to realize that actually in an audience, people still can take on different roles. So um, basically uh, that might sound a little bit abstract, right? How can you be one person or one audience, but still have different roles? And I can illustrate that with an example of, for example, right? I'm now sitting here as a student and um, just now I was working on something about um, concerning uni. So then I was a student, like I had that role. But at the moment I'm giving this workshop. So at the moment I have the role of a teacher. And if I later today go and get a takeaway coffee, then I am a consumer. But then if I do that with a friend and we talk along the way, I have the role of a friend. And in that, all those scenarios, I'm still me, but at the same time, I'm taking on different roles. And that's also the case with uh, strategic communication uh, audiences. So in a supermarket, um, you basically have people in two different roles. So you have the participant of society who's thinking, what's in it for us? So is this product good for the environment? Is it good for animal welfare, etc.? And you have the consumer who's thinking, what's in it for me? So who's mostly like looking for the cheapest sort of um, discounts, etc. And um, that's kind of why uh, we have a lot of irrational behavior in the supermarket and why our audiences of our campaigns have irrational behavior, because we all care about animal welfare and we all know that climate change is a thing, but we still uh, occasionally, or lots of us at least, buy meat. So that's a bit uh, controversial, but that's just because, yes, we're trying to be participants of society, but as soon as we go to the supermarket, what you'll see is that in a supermarket, a lot of the time you're being addressed as a consumer because, um, for example, there's lots of um, cards with like discounts and sales um, uh, being thrown at you. And then you go and slip into that role of a consumer and you just start looking for the cheapest things. And that's important for your campaign as well, guys, to understand. So what role am I actually trying to communicate my um, uh, veggie burger towards? Am I appealing to the participants of the society? So am I going to be emphasizing, for example, how sustainable my veggie burger is? Or are you going to be um, trying to uh, uh, convince the uh, consumers? So telling them how cheap it is or telling them um, how good it tastes. So those uh, things actually have implications for what you do with your campaign. So if we could go to the next slide. Another thing that really complicates, um, you know, marketing your burger is the fact that people don't like change. We actually, as humans, fall into a confirmation trap where we assess new info based on what we already know. So, for example, if you're scrolling on Facebook and you see an article about red meat causing um, diseases and you are already a vegetarian, then you're more likely to interpret that info as being more truthful and reliable. Whereas if you're someone that eats meat regularly, you might think, well, OK, but is it really that bad? Is this not just an exaggeration? And similarly, in a supermarket, um, the people that are vegetarians um, um, will probably go to the vegetarian section, but then people who uh, are 
you know, eating meat and are in that confirmation trap of eating meat might not even go to the uh, vegetarian section. So those are also things to think about if you uh, uh, start building a, a campaign for your sustainable burger. And that also makes behavioural change a little bit harder. So if we could go to the next slide. So yeah, we've talked about why it's quite hard to convince people, but don't fret guys, it's not impossible. And I'm going to be uh, telling you a little bit about how you can do it. So um, for that, we've got the theory of planned behavior, which is on the next slide. Yeah, perfect. So the theory of planned behavior is basically a theory that tells us um, why people behave the way they do. And according to this theory, um, we as humans basically act based on three different things, which is attitude, subjective norm and perceived behavioral control. And that sounds very hard and difficult, but don't worry, it's not. Attitude basically is what do I think about it? So in um, the case of a veggie burger, it's like, do I like the taste of it? Um, or do I think it's cheap, for example? And then, the, sorry, did I hear someone? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, and then the subjective norm is what do others think about it? So if you grew up in a vegetarian family, you're more likely to accept um, uh, veggie alternatives. And perceived behavioral control is, can I do it? So uh, for example, do you know how to prepare a, uh, a meat replacer? So all these three things, um, attitude, so uh, you know, what do I think about it? What do others think about it? And can I do it? All um, make you uh, perform a certain behavior such as uh, buying a veggie burger. But it's important to note that that basically leads to an intention. And as we all know, intention doesn't necessarily uh, equalize behavior because we've all been there in the new year where we're trying to start a new workout regime, but then stop after two weeks. The intention is there, but the behavior isn't. And that's why it's really important that in your campaign, you really try and influence the attitude, the subjective norm and the perceived behavioral control so that the intention gets stronger, so you have more chance of people actually buying your burger. So if we could go to the next slide. So how can you actually use that in a campaign? So for example, the subjective norm, um, if we could just go uh, one, enter. Uh, Miriam, could you just press enter real quick? I think a picture will pop up. Yes, perfect. So this would be an example of the subjective norm. So do others want me to do it? Um, here you see the meatless Monday. So if everyone on Mondays isn't eating meat, then if you um, kind of uh, also tell people to do that in a campaign, that can really help. And then if you could press enter again, Mia. Yes, so this is um, an example of perceived behavior control. So can I do it? If you put recipes, for example, on the packaging of a veggie burger or a uh, uh, veggie product, then people know what to do with it and um, they therefore will be more likely to buy it. But lastly, attitude is a little bit more tricky to influence. And for that, we're going to be looking at framing, which I have a next slide about. Yes. So what is framing? If Yes, thank you for the picture. So as you can see, guys, in reality, on that picture, uh, the man on the right is stabbing the man on the left. But what the media sort of tells you is that if you see it through a certain way, it's the other way around. And that is what framing is. So when you are framing something, you are taking um, uh, reality and you're only showing parts of the truth, but you deliberately leave out other things. Now, that might sound a little bit vague, but then in a campaign that could mean that, for example, you're really emphasizing the fact that um, a veggie burger is super sustainable and it's very low fat and it's very healthy for you but then you don't really include the fact that because it's more low fat um the uh, it might be a little bit less juicy for example than your average beef burger so um framing is basically um uh, taking certain parts of your um, veggie burger and emphasizing that in your campaign and that is something you can use to change attitudes 
And then um, you can also use the six weapons of influence. And um, we will be uh, going through those now. So the first weapon of influence, if we could go to the next slide. Brilliant, thank you, is reciprocity. And the idea of reciprocity is basically, if I do something for you, will you do something for me? So a classic example would be that, for example, in a supermarket, you get a little taster. Or, for example, in a restaurant, when they bring out the bill, you also get like a little uh, um, cup with sweets with it. And what they are doing, um, they're not just giving out these things just because they want you to have a good meal or to have a nice little sweet. There's an actual idea behind this, and that is reciprocity. So that's the idea that by giving you something extra, you are suddenly feeling obliged to sort of pay those dues by giving back. So, for example, by giving the waiter a tip or by buying uh, the things you just had a taste of in the supermarket. So you could also think about how to uh, incorporate that into a campaign for a veggie burger. Then next up indeed is scarcity. As humans, we really love choice and we don't like to be restricted. So um, that's why we're very sort of mesmerized by things that are like rare or unattainable, because we feel like our ability to get those things is being restricted and we don't like that. So in a campaign, what you could do is you could, for example, stress that, oh, there's only two of these burgers left um, because that makes people want to hurry because they don't want to run out of those burgers or at least run out of the option to get those burgers. So that is something that you could also think about. And it, that's the second weapon of influence. And then the third weapon of influence is authority. And that's the idea that we, as humans, we actually believe people that we think are experts. So that's why in uh, toothpaste campaigns, a lot of the time you'll see someone in a big white lab coat um, explaining why that toothpaste is really good for like gum health or whatever. Um, and so that means that if there's an expert involved, we uh, trust them a little bit um, earlier than if there's just a, a random person uh, on TV. And then we have the fourth weapon of influence, which is liking. So about this one, I always feel a little bit, um, um, well, iffy about it because it is a very superficial one. Um, basically, as humans, we say yes to people that we like, and that can be liking because we know them, but there can also be very superficially uh, people that we find attractive. So that's also why models are always being used in commercials, because we are more likely to say yes to someone that we think is pretty. So that could be something that could also think about in your campaign and if you would um, then for example combine liking and authority that would get you uh, the classic example of an influencer so an attractive person with authority over a certain uh, products to tell you oh this product is great so then again let's indeed move on to um, the next weapon of influence which is consensus so again, another little bit superficial trait of humans is that we are social creatures and that we quite like to follow the crowd. So, um, you know, also think back to that subjective norm. We basically um, are influenced by, why, uh, by what others do. And you can, for example, in your campaign, use that to um, um, by saying, oh, uh, so and so many people have bought it and they all loved it. Because that means that people are going to start thinking to themselves, OK, if so many people have bought that product, there must be something really good about it. So that's how you can kind of use consensus in your campaign for your veggie burger as well. And then we have last but not least commitment and consistency. So humans really like consistency. If someone says A one day, one day and then the next day they say B, uh, you're like, OK, what? So what do you mean? But if someone says A today and then A tomorrow and then the A after that, a pattern starts to form. And we are kind of are more likely to take on that pattern as a being the truth. And that's also why um, a lot of companies use logos and slogans. 
they are constantly repeating that image or repeating that sentence to the point where, for example, if I say, just do it, most people will immediately think about Nike. And um, that really shows that sort of consistency and that really creates commitment. So it makes you remember the company and it makes you um, uh, take on anything that the company says as truth a little bit sooner. And another way to um, kind of uh, create that commitment would be through samples. So as you can see on this slide, in the left of the corner, you can see a magazine and they have provided two little samples of a shampoo or something. And what you see quite a lot is that um, in these sort of uh, commercials where they have these samples, um, they'll say, yeah, you'll see results after three washes, but then they only provide two samples. But because at that point, you have already been washing your hair with that shampoo for two days, and it only takes one more day to see that result, you're like, okay, I'll buy the bottle of shampoo in the store. So that's an example of uh, how commitment and consistency comes in. So we are almost at the end of what I wanted to uh, tell you at this point. So we've learned quite a lot today, hopefully. Um, at least we've talked about um, how we are constantly influenced through our surroundings um, and how uh, there's different kinds of communication that are influencing us. Um, so we've talked about the basic model. So remember the sending, receiving, and then also uh, getting feedback. And we've also talked about um, how, um, uh, you know, that feedback gets interpreted differently by different people because they, for example, take on different roles. So the participant of society versus, for example, the consumer. Um, we've talked about the confirmation trap and how people don't like change, which makes it very hard to get a message across. But fortunately, there is the uh, theory of planned behaviour and we've learned how we can influence the attitude, the subjective norm and also the perceived behavioural control by uh, various things in your uh, Veggie Burger campaigns. Um, and we've also looked at especially attitude. So we've seen how, uh, for example, framing can really influence people's attitude or, for example, using those six weapons of influence that we just went through. So all of these things can make a massive difference in to order to influence people um, to buy more sustainable products such as uh, veggie burgers. So I really hope that you have learned something new today and that you maybe already have some ideas for a, a commercial or something that you uh, want to do with your own veggie burger. Um, so thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to tell you a bit more um, about um, yeah what is in the uh, meat replacers. Uh, so first, a short introduction, then uh, for which consumers uh, are meat replacers meant uh, to be, uh, why do we eat them, uh, some pros and cons of the meat replacers, uh, the nutrient composition, and finally, I go a little bit deeper in uh, the structure of uh, the meat replacers. Uh, yeah, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so, uh, well, the meat replacers. You have a lot of different uh, options in the supermarket, um, as you probably all know. Um, they are uh, both vegetarian and uh, vegan options. Uh, vegan options are uh, fully plant-based, so uh, there's no milk or uh, egg added uh, to the product. And um, the products are especially made for people um, who uh, don't want to eat meat. Um, well, for example, flexitarian or um, uh, don't want to eat uh, meat at all. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, yeah, as I told you, um, meat replaces are not essential to eat. Uh, there are also a lot of other uh, protein alternatives, uh, such as pulses, nuts, uh, or dairy products are also full of protein. Uh, but there are a lot of people who really like the juiciness and the bite of, uh, of meat. And uh, they really like it um, to eat a meat replacer instead of meat. 
Uh, therefore, it is very important that, that we can optimize the uh, taste and the texture of uh, those meat alternatives. Um, and in this figure, you can also see um, the relationship between the desired similarity to meat and the consumption of meat replacers. Um, so you can see that consumers will really like um, that texture of meat. Um, they will consume less um, meat replacement products, actually. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, but why is it now uh, so important uh, to consume more re meat replacers? Well, um, first, of course, uh, the meat production is very inefficient. Um, so here in the picture, you can see uh, that you need, uh, for example, 12.4 uh, uh, kilograms of feed and more than 1,000 liters uh, of water to produce one kilogram of beef. Uh, besides uh, the meat production, it leads to pollution, uh, mainly because of uh, the emission of greenhouse gas emissions, um, such as methane, for example. Um, also, um, the price pressure on meat is uh, detrimental to animal welfare. Um, and that's why, for example, also uh, the broiler chicken has arisen. Uh, you can also see it here in the figure. Um, and finally, uh, of course, it is not uh, very good for human health uh, to eat a lot of meat. Um, animals can be infected with uh, viruses and bacteria, for example, um, and it can be transmitted to uh, human people. Uh, an example of this is uh, the Q fever, for example. Um, on top of that, it is also uh, better for the human health uh, to eat less meat uh, because of the protein consumption. Um, people often eat 50% uh, more uh, protein than necessary. Uh, it's not especially harmful uh, for the human health, but it's also not, uh, not good. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So in short, uh, here an overview of the pros and cons of uh, meat replacers. Uh, so the pros are that it's uh, more sustainable, of course. Uh, better for the animal welfare, uh, better for the human health. Um, and also there are uh, a lot more uh, possibilities and flexibility um, with uh, the production of uh, meat replacers because it is an uh, industrial process. Um, the cons are uh, that the taste and texture is still very different from meat and um, people find it not fibrous enough, uh, sometimes a bit tasteless and dry. And I will tell you a little bit more uh, later why this is the case. Um, and uh, finally, um, meat replacers are more expensive than uh, meat. So you can see that chicken is uh, almost half of the price uh, than a vegetarian, vegetarian chicken. So this will not encourage uh, people to buy it. Um, yeah, next slide please. Then a little bit more uh, of the texture of meat. Well, uh, meat uh, does not have uh, any carbohydrates. So it consists of uh, fat and proteins uh, with water in between. Um, so it's actually the protein fiber and in between is that water. And uh, this texture really creates that juicy structure because the water is uh, kind of loose uh, around the protein. Um, so that makes it very juicy. Um, next slide, please. But uh, what are carbohydrates and uh, proteins now exactly then? So uh, we go still to a little bit uh, lower level. Um, carbohydrates uh, and proteins are both uh, long chains of building blocks. Um, and carbohydrates are especially for the energy in your body, while proteins uh, serve for um, yeah, for muscle building, for uh, keeping yourself strong. Um, and the long uh, chains, uh, as you can see here, they are folded in a three dimensional structure. And this uh, structure will change um, when the temperature changes. So then uh, this folding um, can be different. Um, next slide, please. In short, about the nutrient composition, composition of the meat replacers. Um, 
there's uh, quite a difference with uh, real meat uh, because um, in general meat replacers do have uh, 30 to 35 percent of dry matter of which uh, 15 to 25 percent is protein and a little bit carbohydrates um, if you compare that to the structure of meat you can see that meat uh, does not contain any carbohydrates as i told you already um, it has a little bit of fat and a bit more protein than meat replacers. Uh, meat also consists um, some vitamins, which are uh, essential for um, human people. So it's quite important that uh, those vitamins are also added to uh, meat replacers. Especially if um, people uh, eat more meat replacers instead of meat. Next slide, please. Um, but as I told you, um, the texture of meat replacers, uh, a lot of people uh, find them still a little bit too dry or less juicy than meat. And this is especially because of the carbohydrates in uh, the meat replacers. Um, because carbohydrates uh, do have a, a water binding effect. So that means that they uh, really easily can take up water, uh, kind of a sponge you can compare it to. And this leads to a dry structure. Moreover, um, it is that protein is not structured on a very small scale. And this can also lead to that water binding effect, um, which make, makes the meat replacer a little bit more dry. Um, also, we are still working on the fibrous structure because, um, yeah, people really like that um, structure of a real steak, for example. Uh, next slide, please. So um, a bit more about the production processes uh, of the meat replacers. Uh, you have actually three main processes, um, and two of them I will tell you a little bit more about. Um, extrusion, this is the first uh, process. Um, this is actually that you press a material uh, through a shape with the help of heat, and afterwards uh, you let cool it down. This is also the process uh, what we use, for example, to make uh, pasta or crisps. Um, and, but also for creating the fibrous uh, protein structure, it's a very useful uh, process. So uh, first, the uh, uh, protein carbohydrate mixture goes through the extruder. And afterwards, uh, water, fat and flavoring is added. Because it is not possible to do that on beforehand. So therefore, the flavoring is um, right now only on the surface of the product and not um, yeah, only on the surface of the product. Uh, next slide, please. Um, well, a funny fact is actually that uh, those extruders uh, are especially designed for efficient mixing um, and not for structuring. So uh, as I told, uh, it is used for making, for example, also pasta or crisps. Um, and later on, uh, they found out that it's also very useful uh, to make uh, protein structures. And uh, in the right, uh, on the picture, you can see um, so, such a structured protein aligned in uh, one direction. So that's how it comes out of, uh, out of the extruder, actually. Uh, next slide. Uh, here you can see that uh, structured protein a little bit better. So, um, from position one, you can see that aligned arrangement of the protein. And from position two, you can see a cross-sectional view. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that's kind of the fiber structure what you get um, after the process. Uh, next slide. Well, the other uh, production process, uh, which I will tell you something about, is um, the process uh, with shear cells. It is also used uh, a lot on uh, the Wageningen University um, for research to improve the taste and the texture um, of those meat replacers. Um, and with the use of the shear cells, it is um, really good to, um, to introduce differences in the color and um, the, the structure um, of the meat replacer. So therefore, it's especially, especially useful, for example, to make a vegetarian steak. Um, next slide, please. So uh, what exactly happens then uh, in such a shear cell? Um, 
Well, uh, the difference in deformation in shear cell that comes uh, is actually because of uh, three types of flow. Uh, you have elongational flow, rotation, and shear flow. Um, with elongational flow, the fibers uh, going more to a converging channel, and afterwards you get that aligned uh, protein structure. Um, well, with shear flow, um, that's more what you see in the bottom on the right. Um, so uh, on the left, uh, you can see such a shear cell, and it consists of uh, two surfaces. And one of those surfaces uh, is going to uh, rotate. Um, and in between is the protein carbohydrate structure. And then uh, due to si simple shear flow in this uh, shear cell, you get that aligned protein structure. Um, so you get a real elongated structure and uh, the length of those fibers uh, can be narrowly controlled in such a shear cell. Um, so that's very useful. Uh, next slide, please. But uh, that development of this uh, good firm structure, um, that's only possible when you use um, two proteins uh, which are not uh, mixable with each other. Um, often a mixture of um, soy protein and gluten protein is used. Um, and when you use those proteins, uh, you get phase separation afterwards. Um, so it's that uh, droplets of the one protein um, are in the other protein. That's called also an emulsion. Maybe you know about this. Um, afterwards, the deformation is applied, as I told in the previous slide. And in the end, you get then the fibrous structure. And that's what you see also um, in the bottom, uh, uh, in the figure. Um, on a very small scale, you can see um, the fibers which, uh, which are created. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So, uh, in short, I told you actually now a bit more about this uh, prediction process of the meat replacers. Um, but what are now the next steps uh, to improve the taste and the texture? Well, uh, for improvement of the taste, it's especially important that uh, the flavoring comes also inside um, the product. Because now it's uh, added after uh, the processes. So then it's only on the surface of the product. And uh, we would like to have the flavoring also inside, but this is still uh, quite a challenge, also in combination with, um, with the salt, um, salt content of the, um, of the product. Furthermore, uh, it's uh, important that we can um, produce it on a bigger scale, because uh, then, of course, it will also be a, a much cheaper process. And this can also lead to a much more uh, sustainable food production in the future. And finally, what is very important is the nutritional value um, of the meat replacers. I also told a little bit in the beginning of, um, of my presentation about this, but uh, especially important for human people is that uh, meat replacers contain enough essential amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of the proteins. Um, and this is uh, very useful that we get uh, enough of this, uh, um, of those essential amino acids. Um, moreover, it's important uh, that there are enough micronutrients uh, such as vitamins and minerals in uh, the meat replacers. Um, because it's those vitamins which are also in real meat. Uh, next slide, please. Well, um, I told you now a bit more about uh, the taste, the texture, uh, the production pro mo most important production processes uh, of the meat replacers. And uh, hopefully you can uh, use this information uh, for the exercise uh, you are going to do. So uh, a lot of good luck and uh, hopefully uh, you liked uh, this presentation. <laughs> Thank you for listening.